Few populations had to adapt more rapidly during 2020 than parents. We instantly became full-time teachers, cooks, and caregivers, all while trying to adapt to a new professional landscape. We are going to be back here next year, October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, to continue the story of each of your own responsive organizations and to further this movement even forward. Everything was new, and nothing was easy. As a curious parent who happens to be a filmmaker, I wanted to explore the experiences that parents in our community were having. What was working? What wasn't? And what happens when every part of our personal and professional lives gets smashed together? We're gonna just maybe go into town one day and do some wine tasting with the kids at like a family friendly place, go to the beach one day, and then just hang. Get away from all the madness. Yeah. Merit Kiesenbing Anderson is a mother to three kids. She's an advocate and leader in the tech space. Merit is passionate about utilizing her background in employment law and human resources to make organizations better. Hi, Merit. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm just delighted to be here with you. How did 2020 start for you? I was just spinning up my consultancy. You know, I had started, I'd opened up my kind of practice at the end of of 2019 and had taken on my first client in Washington, D.C. And so I was spending a lot of time in those first couple months traveling back and forth because I was supporting them in the search of a new CEO and calibration and assessment of their talent. So it was like this beautiful time of going back to D.C. where I went to school for a time and loved being back there and hadn't been back there for a long time. And was getting to do some traveling, um, which was nice. Um, getting kind of out of the the routine of being home with the kids, which was also new to me. How about you? The year before, my work with with Robin and Xander Media um, had really just ramped up, and I was out in San Francisco up to like two weeks a month. Sometimes San Francisco is like magic to me. I spent most of my twenties in Southern California, so it's just like any chance to get back to California, I'm I'm there for it. And as like a uh, you know a freelance video producer, having the, the Xander Media team develop and be a part of that has been like just a breath of fresh air for me professionally. And like the the kids were just doing great, you know, things were just humming along. It just felt like kind of an ideal adult life that was like like kind of just happening around us and we were participating in and the velocity of the, like the stop was just like so jarring. Okay, so, to be here. so that's why there's kind of a big chunk of that Tuesday through Saturday, just, you know, we can choose the 14th through the 19th so that's a Monday through Saturday. One thing that I would say that comes to mind is that being a parent this year was doing so much more. There was no chance to rely on any of these other organizations to help. Well, it makes me think of the classic quote, my Angelou, it takes a village and there was no village. There was so much isolation um, that there was so much falling on the parents' shoulders. Jeremy Azell is a father to two children. He spent most of his professional life as a therapist and psychoanalyst, but he's recently transitioned into the tech space, where he's a senior business partner for diversity, inclusion, and belonging at Indeed.com. So first, let's just start off just a brief introduction. Tell me who you are, what you do, which is kind of a complicated question now. Kind of a complicated question. Four days ago, I was a psychotherapist. <laughs> so I just made that transition um, yeah, into corporate work, corporate DIMB work. Do you think you would have changed careers had the pandemic not happened? I would have changed careers probably in about five to 10 years. Okay. The pandemic did not introduce anything, it accelerated it yeah. big time. That's probably a pretty common theme for a lot of I would imagine. change that people experience, mm -hmm. like an accelerant. 
Ma, mama, mama. Dad, dad does at work. Dad does at work. He went to work. Mama loves you. Ellen Meza is a mother of four, two of whom are twins. She is the director of global benefits and mobility at DocuSign and also lends her expertise to startups as an advisor for people tech partners. Has your living situation throughout the pandemic, has it pretty much stayed the same? Yeah, you know, we have not been lonely during the pandemic. That's the beautiful thing about having a big family. We had the opportunity, obviously, with our kids being in public school to actually go to school pre-pandemic. And when that changed and everyone needed to be home, um, and I was working at home with my husband as well, we needed help. And so actually my mother-in-law decided to come and live with us. So Monday through Friday, she comes and stays in our guest room and takes care of one of the twins. And then we also hired a facilitator to manage a pod school downstairs in our garage. And two of the older kids, plus two other kids from the neighborhood, come in and do school throughout the day. So we've got like <laughs> four adults at home um, taking care of all sorts of people and doing good work. So we're here in San Jose and we've been here. I think the difference has been one that up until the beginning of November, all of the kids were being educated at home on Zoom. And my husband um, is also here. So we share an office. In the spring, we did a one-room schoolhouse where they were all in our playroom at one six-foot Costco table together. <laughs> and we realized, you know, they had kind of outlived that. And my two little ones have become inseparable. I say that's one of my joy bombs of this whole pandemic is just they have each other. I said, think of what it would be like if you were an only child and you just had us. How have your kids been throughout all this? In the beginning, I would have said they were great and totally resilient. They have each other. You know, they're having fun. And what a special time to get mom and dad, you know, all day, <laughs> all night. But I have to say, m more recently, I've seen a lot of frustration and anxiety coming through with the older kids, especially around change. It was so difficult. And, and then to see your kids struggling with not being able to hang out with their friends and just them being very lonely. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs is basically, I mean, if you don't have food, water, and shelter, you can't contemplate the stars. I mean, you can't really kind of think about what the, the grand things in life when you just, you need to survive. And so many people are just trying to survive. And, there's just these, these incredibly massive systems that are trying to keep them in a position where all they can do is try to survive, and then they're exploited. And so, yeah, and then you, and then you, you know, these organizations or people or systems that are constantly telling people to live with purpose, but not then give them access or give a chance to. Yeah, I think that is directly talking to parents, like because there's so much that. In, in, in like work that is like, you know, whether or not it's purposeful or not, is it is exploitative, mm -hmm. right? And we tell parents that we want them to, to take care of their priorities, mm -hmm. but then we don't give them the tools or the resources mm -hmm. to actually do that. Do that, yeah. The pandemic hit and all of a sudden the people leader became the center of this conversation. You know, the life vest, the buoy of like, how do you help companies navigate through this. And so it became really, for me, I just got inundated with work around, okay, you were at GitHub, you did it before it needed and had to be done. It was a conscious choice versus a situation that we were all thrust into. So you're in a very specific role right now during a very difficult time in your specific field. So you, you are uniquely lined up to talk about some of the things that companies can do well to support their, their especially, let's talk specifically about parents uh, during this time. So like what, what kinds of things have you been specifically implementing, thinking about for your company during this time? The first thing, obviously, was making sure that everyone was safe. So, you know, getting people to their homes, setting them up, and making sure they had access to whatever it was that they needed. And then to focus in on parents, 
really understanding what it meant to have a school closure, to all of a sudden become a teacher, to, you know, a kindergartner, and being able to balance those two jobs of, you know, parent and employee of this company when your surroundings don't change. And so we really had to think about that and say, maybe time off is right for people to make this adjustment and prepare but then that's going to run out because we can't have you be gone the entire pandemic. Maybe it's support tools. Maybe it's a vendor like care.com or something to help you find support. But what if you're not comfortable having someone in your home during a pandemic to care for your kids? So then it's uh, different hours that you work. It's, um, you know, a flex schedule where you work, you know, four tens. There was all these things that we had to bring to the table specifically for the parents that were dealing with the extra burden of not just the health concern, but now everyone being home and needing them all the time. Mama? Yeah, you can just bring us. Yeah, I'm upstairs. And to balance that with your day job was almost impossible. I think especially at the onset with with zero tools. It slowly got easier, but it was employers like DocuSign and the other big employers out there that were saying, aha, I see this as a unique problem during this pandemic. Caregivers, parents especially, need a little bit more. Dr. Stephanie Johnson out of Colorado, she wrote a New York Times bestseller, Inclusify, that came out over the summer of last year. And What's amazing is that if companies do that and they treat their employees humanely and, and with a sense of safety, innovation goes through the roof. Bottom line, I mean, companies make more money. You're just, everybody's happier. Everybody's doing a better job. Uh, they're getting along. They want to be a part of that company. It's like, there's no downside. There's been a lot of positive behavior change around on the other side of this, what we're going to tolerate and what the workplace will look like. And if it's going to be enough to say, you know what, I got to move on somewhere else where they're going to be more inclusive of who I am as a parent and, you know, what I'm trying to achieve in both work and in life. This year, we were pushed to the limits of intimacy with our families and her work. For the first time, our coworkers probably saw the inside of our homes even our bedrooms. And my kids are now on a first name basis with all of the tiny faces in the boxes on my screen. I had to ask myself a lot of questions about balance, about boundaries, and how to live fully in both family and workspaces simultaneously. I want you to just respond to a phrase, and the phrase is work-life balance. I don't use the phrase work-life balance anymore. I've chosen to call it work-family balance. And I do that because I believe the family is finite and life is a little bit vague. And I want to be able to talk about work-family balance concretely. And I really want people to, one, be able to define family as they see fit. It might be my pet Fido, but it actually might be my four kids. And work-family balance is is also not just about time. It's about the mental capacity to do both things, you know, at the same time. And is that sustainable? I don't know. Maybe for a while. I'll, to ask me in a year. <laughs> <laughs> do you think the idea of, like, balance in there is helpful? What it really is, is you don't turn one off to do the other. So it's not like you're sitting on a scale and saying, oh, I'm giving this much to one and this much to another. I think that's an old idea. I think the new idea is how do you do these things together and still function as a capable human being in the world and have the capacity and mental wherewithal to feel successful at the end of the day in both the family and the work. How do I navigate all of us being in this either confined or small space uh, where we normally have have all left and to go do our thing, gone to school, gone to work, um, to a physical location, and now we're all crammed together and people are on phone calls, people are on, you know, children are on Zoom calls with teachers and it's loud. (laughs) There's a hard part in all of this. It's like everything melds together. I feel like there's not really separation of home and work. We're all just kind of, it's fluid. It's kind of running into each other. The very job that I hold 
is meant to be part of my parenting. It's meant uh, to be a part of what I want to give to my kids. Dr. Vivian Ming is a mother of two kids and a professional mad scientist. As a theoretical neuroscientist, entrepreneur, and author, she co-founded Socos Labs, an independent institute exploring the future of human potential. I simply find problems that uh, engage with me, both intellectually and my sense of purpose. One of the things in our pre-interview that I was that was really helpful to me just personally was the idea of a highly integrated person. One that work and family and all the different facets of your life are not separate buckets, but they are one unified thing. Before we dive into the idea of how do we all take some, you know, philosophical plunge and somehow, I'm sure for many people, magically integrate all aspects of their life, from our own research, maybe 80% of people who found themselves working from home for the first time going remote uh, really struggled. That it just was not part of who they thought that they were. And, and I don't just mean like this is a socioeconomic divide. Uh, we see, in fact, highly educated university grads with elite jobs that could not find separation uh, between work and life, and they needed it. People e e would, would actually work more, and they were really stressed by the fact that they were working more because they were at home, they weren't commuting. Um, there, was a, there was a felt sense of urgency because everything was just, with this work from home, everything was right there, and so they were getting actually more stressed out because they didn't have space. Work slowly erodes quality of life and family. So find a hard balance. Um, but then you've got the whole rest of your life ahead of you to start thinking about why does it seem so scary for me to be, not my job, uh, I don't see my life that way, um, but for me to just be me, I'm a mad scientist, which is a mom and a scientist, and an entrepreneur, and a writer, and every other bit of crazy nonsense at the exact same time. I feel I'm being a good mom when I do my job. The pandemic showed me how important love and relationships are. And I, I thought I knew that, and I, and I did, but um, this just incredibly intense experience of time condensed down really, really assessing what matters to me, yeah. what really, really matters to me, and what do I want my life to look like, and what's important, which was part of the career change. Um, being a single dad and being a psychotherapist, I'm sure there are people that could do it and it's really hard, but for me, it's like, this isn't, that's, there's a lot of other factors that went into that decision, but for me, there was like, I, I wanna be more present. When I think about purpose, I think of it as a facilitator. Purpose is something that makes it easier. All the things that would be terrifying if it were all about me are not when it's never about me. I mean, that's the one terrifying thing you have to accept. It's not about me. It's not about whether I'm happy. It's about whether I'm serving my purpose. For me, that purpose happens to be very grounded, uh, very human. And it's fine for me that, and in fact inevitable, that people find purpose in some other things, some of which might be intangible or spiritual. That's Great. If it is something that you, for which you are willing to make a sacrifice, and let's just put it this way, and it's pro-social, it, it is good for others. Um, I, I don't know, in fact, that a purpose truly has to be. I think there's a lot of ambiguity in the research. But here's the one thing that's clear. There is not one thing you are meant to do. There isn't one purpose waiting for you, right? It is something you get to construct for yourself. And if you get to construct it, construct something which is good. The, the sort of like the isolation of it all has kind of brought up some things that I don't really like about myself all that much. And I've had to like find ways to, to, to be authentic to that and to deal with it. Most of that's like how I show up as a parent. Yeah. How, how am I really showing up as a partner? Um, and all these things. And 
uh, like what's what's stopping me from from being uh, the best version of that that I imagine myself to be. That's also been a struggle for me. I want to be great at all of these things, right? But the addition of this pandemic has made it made it incredibly hard to be able to really draw the line between when am I the people leader, the consultant, the person that has all the answers to help people navigate this unprecedented time in the workplace? And when do I want to just say like, excuse my language, like, fuck it all. I, I need to go be with my kids. And that's been so hard, really, really hard. Um, Cause there's been times where you could hide behind, okay, I wasn't great because I was on a business trip to Amsterdam and I missed that performance, but I'm not missing the things here. And it's that tension of like, you feel like you have a choice because you're in a house and you're with them and you're around them and they're not at school. And you can say, hey, I can table that for work. But it's hard because on the other side of that office door are the humans that you want to be with, but you want to feel fulfilled and that you're doing impactful work. And so I think it's been really challenging. Even though we were all living in isolation to differing degrees, at some point, we were all collectively feeling the pain of failure as we were overextended and overwhelmed. Healing from trauma needs a witness. And a witness has to be outside of the trauma. Okay. With the pandemic, there was not a witness. Nobody was outside of it. Us as the therapists, we weren't outside of it. The spouse wasn't outside of it. There was nobody to go to that was like, oh, I'm not a part of that, but I can bear witness to it. And so- So is like the witness like validates the thing that happened? The witness validates the thing that happened, but the witness can enter into the felt sense of what that experience was without actually have been a part of that experience. The pandemic, and this has recalibrated all of mental health in a lot of ways. As therapists, we weren't able to sit with people and not be actually, we were all being traumatized at the same time that we were helping the people who were being traumatized. And so there was no one on the outside of it. So everyone went remote, everyone went to you know virtual. The trauma that people already were dealing with was being compounded at a tremendous rate in a variety of different ways, whether that was through difficulties at home or an inability to, um, really an inability to live a full life to try to do any level of self-care. Yeah. Because um, I would ask people routinely, how are you feeding back in, into yourself and the things that they would normally do, whether that be go to a gym, go out to eat, go hang out with friends, um, go to a movie, they, you just couldn't do that safely. Um, a lot of places you just couldn't do that. And so I think that was a very, very difficult thing that we learned was that when these global events like this happen psychologically, I don't really know what the, that's gonna be downstream of this yeah. for the years to come. You know, we are at a point right now where we're going to be returning to normal. What are the things that, like, what are the patterns of life that you think are just like forever changed after this? I think the way we think about our, our health and how we value our health will be changed. And so that's really the, the big one for most of us. Um, I also think that how kind we are to ourselves and others has really changed. I just think wearing a mask during flu season might be a thing now because, you know, COVID exists. Um, covering your nose when you sneeze or cough, um, asking before you touch or hug someone, like sort of the social interactions that we've had in the past that we've taken uh, for granted, I think are forever changed. I'm an incredibly extroverted person and I realized through the process that I really thrive on human connection. There is a degree of like isolation and I, the, what I fear in like the fact that this has not been a couple weeks or months, but rather a year is that I've become accustomed to that survivalist mode where I'm okay without seeing other people to the point now where I know that there's going to be some fear about re-entering into what that looks like when you haven't had that connection with folks for such a long period of time, right? I always hate arriving to the party last because people have already connected and have started kind of dialogue. And when I come in, you're already feeling like, oh, I missed a few things. And I'm like, geez, I've missed a year. You know, I've missed a year of life just trying to kind of 
juggle all the facets of this. Um, and I hope it doesn't change like who I am as a person. Um, and there's not like fear around that social connection, but there's gonna have to be some intentionality around how you rebuild those relationships. Will we lead with fear and maybe prevent ourselves from doing things that bring us joy? Or will we lead with kindness and hope and ask the right questions and trust those around us? And will we only keep those around us that we can trust, which maybe is a good thing? To see that we made it through, that my family made it through, that Sokos Labs made it through, that everything was wildly imperfect, and yet we adapted. We changed in the ways that we had to, to continue to find happiness and community and to have uh, an impact to serve our purpose. We were able to do that. It really, I think, speaks to that basic idea that if you want to teach your child one skill, this one magic skill that will somehow prepare them for the future of work, teach them how to explore the unknown. Because years like this are gonna come more and more often. And we need to start learning how to, all of us, change and adapt in near real time. This has given me the opportunity to put that lens like very brightly on the skills of being a parent so absolutely 100% translate to what we have to do in work. Multitasking and juggling and prioritization. I mean, these are core competencies where it's not realistic for you to sit in a dark corner of an office and never have an interruption. That's not what right. life is, right? So it's been really cool to say, take those skills, package them up, put them into you returning to work around, hey, you've been doing like operations in management and prioritization and project management for years. And now we've had to do it on a whole nother level. I think a lot of us this year have been doing our best. <laughs> Just do your best. But that's not always like the easiest thing to tell yourself. How do we give ourselves the grace to mm -hmm. say, I did my best? Mm -hmm. and, well, and I would even tweak it a little bit and say, good enough. Good enough. Good enough. Um, one, of the, one of the most famous, my favorite psychoanalyst, uh, Dr. Winnicott, he talked about the good enough mother. And we've extrapolated that out, the good enough parent. And the good enough parent is actually the best parent. You gave your kids pretzels for dinner. Eh, it could have been worse. They ate. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and some nights when I do what I think is really well, and I cook them like this organic home-cooked meal and they don't eat it, I say, meh, it's okay. If they were hungry, they would. Um, and it's, it's a practice. Every day I sit down and I practice forgiving myself, forgiving them, and letting some of this stuff roll. And so that's the sense of like, it's good enough is good enough. And, and that's a wonderfully freeing, uh, non-anxious presence that you create for yourself, you create for your children, you give them that sense of, it doesn't mean that you don't try. It's like, that's, just, that's, that's good enough. Yeah, like uh, ship that, man, let's go with that. And that's enough for today. Good enough's, good enough's great. I think the thing that has gotten us through this time has been stepping back and giving ourselves the, the space and the time and the energy to be fully present with the thing that's right in front of us, whether or not that's our child, our partner, the work that we have to do. When we step back and say like, all these things are not in conflict with each other, but they're all part of this whole thing that gives my life meaning, then that's enough. It's enough. <laughs>